Hi everyone, my name is Wilson Shirley, and welcome to the American Enterprise Institute's The Bradley Lectures on the AEI podcast channel. The Bradley Lectures, given for over a quarter century at AEI, beginning in September 1989, were sponsored by the Lind and Harry Bradley Foundation. AEI senior fellow Carlin Bowman and I hope to bring new life to this series by releasing them as podcasts for your enjoyment. In this episode, we're revisiting Defining Deviancy Up by the late, great Charles Krauthammer, originally delivered at our headquarters in September of 1993. Earlier that year, Daniel Patrick Moynihan had written an article titled Defining Deviancy Down. He made the case that, from collapsing family life, to crime, to mental illness, Americans had come to accept what was once considered deviant behavior as part of everyday normal life. Dr. Krauthammer believed Moynihan had only gotten half of the story. Americans had not given up on policing norms altogether. Rather, we had started to define as deviant behavior that had once been considered typical and even healthy. Krauthammer worried that that would change everything from middle-class family life to ordinary sexual relationships, all while giving a pass to genuine criminality. And with that, here's Charles Krauthammer on Defining Deviancy Up. In 1940, a survey was taken of teachers asking them to list the five most important problems they encountered in school. Fifty years later, uh, the questionnaire was repeated. Here are the results. The number one problem in 1940, talking out of turn. In 1990, drug abuse. Second most important problem 50 years ago, chewing gum, in 1990, alcohol abuse. The next three worst problems for teachers in 1940, making noise, running in halls, cutting in line. In 1990, pregnancy, suicide, rape. One could cite a mountain of statistics. One could supply one's own anecdotal evidence. But this list makes the obvious point that there has been an explosion of deviancy in American society over the last 50 years. Things have gotten out of hand. How have we dealt with that? Daniel Patrick Moynihan offers an arresting approach in a recent essay in the American Scholar entitled Defining Deviancy Down. His point is that deviancy, crime, broken homes, mental illness, has reached such vast and incomprehensible proportions that we have had to adopt a singular form of denial. We deal with the epidemic by simply defining away most of the disease. We lower the threshold for what we are prepared to call normal in order to keep the the volume of deviancy, redefined deviancy, within manageable proportions. For example, since 1960, the incidence of single parenthood has more than tripled. It now afflicts, and anyone acquainted with the figures for poverty and the various social pathologies associated with single parenthood knows that afflicts is the correct word, it now afflicts more than a quarter of all American children. As the problem has grown, however, it has become systematically redefined by the culture, by social workers, by intellectuals, and most famously by the mass media, as simply another lifestyle choice. Dan Quayle may have been right, but Murphy, Brown got the better ratings. Moynihan's second example is crime. We have become completely inured to levels of criminality that would have been considered intolerable 30 years ago. The St. Valentine's Day massacre, which caused a national uproar and merited not one but two entries in the World Book Encyclopedia, involved four thugs killing seven others. An average weekend in L.A., notes James Q. Wilson. More than half of all violent crimes are not even reported. We have come to view homicide 
as a, an as as ineradicable a part of the cultural landscape as car accidents. And finally, there's mental illness. Now, unlike family breakdown and criminality, there has probably been no increase in rates of mental illness over the last uh, 30 years. Rates of schizophrenia do not change, but the rates of hospitalization for schizophrenia and other psychoses have changed. The mental hospitals have been emptied. In 1955, New York State had in its asylums 93,000 patients. Today there are 11,000. Where have that remaining 82,000 and their descendants gone? Onto the streets mostly. In one generation, a flood of pathetically ill people has washed onto the streets of the American city. We now step over these wretched and abandoned people, sleeping in doorways and freezing on grates. They too have become an accepted part of the natural landscape. We have managed to do that by redefining, by redefining them as people who simply lack affordable housing. They're not crazy or sick, they're just very poor as if anyone who's crazy and sick and totally abandoned would not end up very poor. Moynihan's powerful point is that with the moral deregulation of the 1960s, we've had an explosion of deviancy in family life, in criminal behavior, and in publicly displayed psychosis. And we have dealt with it in the only way possible, by defining deviancy down so as to explain away and make normal what a more civilized, ordered, and healthy society would long ago have labeled, and once long ago did label, deviant. Now, Moynihan is right, but it's only half the story. With this lecture, I propose to tell the other half. There's a complementary social phenomenon that goes with defining deviancy down. As part of the vast social project of moral leveling, it is not enough for the deviant to be normalized. The normal must also be found to be deviant. Therefore, while for criminals and crazies, deviancy has been defined down, the bar defining normality has been lowered. For the ordinary bourgeois, deviancy has been defined up. The bar defining normality has been raised. Large areas of ordinary behavior, hitherto considered benign, have had their threshold radically redefined up so that once innocent behavior now stands condemned as deviant. Normal middle class life then stand exposed as the true home of, uh, of violence, abuse, misogyny, and a whole catalog of deviant acting and thinking. As part of this project of moral leveling, whole new areas of deviancy, such as date rape and politically incorrect speech, have been discovered. And old areas, such as child abuse, have been amplified by endless reiteration in the public presses and validated by learned reports about their astonishing frequency. The net effect is to show that deviancy is not the province of the criminals and the crazies, but thrives in the heart of the great middle class. The real deviants of society stand unmasked. Who are they? Not Bonnie and Clyde, but Ozzie and Harriet. The moral deconstruction of middle-class normality is a vast project. Fortunately, it has thousands of, of, of volunteers working on the case. By defining deviancy up, they have scored some notable successes, three in particular, and in precisely the same three areas that Moynihan identified, family life, crime, and mental illness. First, family life. Under the new dispensation, 
it turns out that the ordinary middle class family is not the warm, welcoming fount of family values, not the bedrock of social stability and psychic integrity that the right wing propagandist would have it. It is instead a cauldron of pathology, a teeming source of the depressions, alienations, and assorted dysfunctionalities of adulthood. Why? Because at the heart of the family lies the worm, you see, the newly discovered original sin of the 1990s, child abuse. Now, child abuse is, of course, a real problem. But is it really 19 times more prevalent today than 30 years ago? That is what the statistics offer. In 1963, 150,000 reported the cases. In 1992, 2.9 million. Now, simply considering the historical trajectory of the treatment of children since the 19th century, when child labor, even child slavery, was common, it is hard to believe that the tendency to the improved tr treatment of children has been so radically reversed in one generation. Plainly, it hasn't. What happened then? The first thing that happened was an epidemic of over-reporting. Douglas Besharov points out that whereas in 1975, about one-third of child abuse cases were dismissed for lack of evidence, Today, about two-thirds are dismissed. New York authorities may have considered it a great social advance that between 1979 and 1983, for example, reported cases of child abuse increased by almost 50 percent. But over the same period, the number of substantiated the cases actually declined. In other words, the 22,000 increase of reported cases yielded an increase of real cases of less than zero. Note the contrast. For ordinary crime to which we have become desensitized, we have defined deviancy down. One of the measures of this defining down is underreporting. Two out of every three ordinary crimes is never even reported. Child abuse is precisely the opposite. For child abuse, to which, we have ex to which we have become exquisitely oversensitized, the numbers are precisely the opposite. Deviancy has been correspondingly defined up, and one of the measures of this defining up is over-reporting, whereas two out of every three ordinary crimes is never reported, two out of every three reported cases of child abuse has never occurred. The perceived epidemic of child abuse is made up of many factors. Clearly over-reporting is one. Changing societal standards about corporal punishment is obviously another. Using current standards and definitions of child abuse I dare say that most of my father's generation would have been classified as abused. But beyond the numbers and the definitions, there is a new ideology of child abuse. Under its influence, the helping professions committed to the belief in endemic abuse have encouraged a massive search for cases and where they cannot be found a massive interest in inventing them. Consider this advice from one of the more popular self-help books on sex abuse, Courage to Heal. Quote, if you are unable to remember any specific instances of childhood sexual abuse, but still have the feeling that something abusive happened to you, it probably did. And, quote, if you think you were abused and your life shows the symptoms, than you were, if your life shows the symptoms. In a popular culture saturated with tales of child abuse, it is not hard to suggest to the vulnerable patients that their problems, their symptoms, are caused by long ago abuse, indeed sometimes 
unremembered abuse. Hence the reductio ad absurdum of the search for the hidden epidemic. The adults who present themselves suddenly as victims of child abuse after decades of supposed amnesia. The amnesia reversed and the memory reclaimed thanks to the magic of intensive psychotherapy. The idea of the repressed memory, so popular during the Freudian heyday of the 40s and the 50s, has a very shaky scientific basis. One does not even have to consult the scientific studies of, thera of therapeutic suggestion, however, of which there are many. Anyone who has ever been a therapist knows how easy it is for memories to be created at the suggestion of a trusted doctor whom the patient wants to please. But why should memories of child abuse please the therapist? Because it fits the new ideology of neurosis. For almost a century, Freudian ideology located the source of adult neurosis in the perceived psychosexual traumas of childhood. But Freud conclusion, concluded, after initial skepticism, that these psychosexual incidents were fantasy. Today, of course, that conclusion is seen as either a great error or, as Jeffrey Mason and other anti-Freudians have insisted, a great betrayal of what he knew to be the truth. Today's fashion, replacing the Freudian fashion, is that the fantasies are true. Whenever a patient presents with depression, low self-esteem, or any of the common ailments of modern life, the search begins for the underlying childhood sexual abuse. As the book says, if your life shows the symptoms, then you were abused. This new psychology is rooted in and also reinforces current notions about the pathology of the ordinary family. Rather than believing, as we did for a hundred years under the influence of Freud, that adult with neurosis results from the inevitable psychological traumas of sexual maturation, compounded by the largely innocent errors of parents and crystallized in the literally fantastic memories of the patient, there is now a new dispensation. Nowadays, a neurosis is the outcome not of innocent errors, but of criminal acts occurring in the very bosom of the ordinary looking family. Seek and you shall find. The sins of the fathers are visible in the miserable lives of the sons and the daughters. Child abuse is the crime only waiting to be discovered with, of course, the proper therapy therapeutic guidance and bedtime reading. It is the dirty little secret behind the white picket fence. And beside this offense, the once regarded deviancies of family life, such as illegitimacy, appear trivial and benign. So much for the family. Let's look now at a second pillar of everyday bourgeois life, ordinary heterosexual relations. A vast second category of human behavior that until recently was considered rather normal has had its threshold for normalcy redefined up so as to render much of it deviant. Again, we start with a real offense, rape. It used to be understood as involving the use of or the threat of force, no longer. It has now been expanded by the concept of date rape to encompass an enormous continent of behavior that had long been seen as normal or at worst ambiguous, but certainly not criminal. Quote, some 47% of women are victims of rape or attempted rape, and 25% of, of women are victims of completed rape. So asserts Catherine McKinnon on national television. Assertions of this sort are commonplace. A Stanford survey, for example, claims that a third of its women have suffered date rape. If these numbers sound high, they are. If one goes by the real numbers, 
compiled by the FBI under the Uniform Crime Reporting Program and suitably multiplied to account for presumed unreported cases. The real numbers for rape, as Neil Gilbert has pointed out in the public interest, are somewhere around one in a thousand. How does one explain the vast discrepancy? One in two differs from one in a thousand by a factor of 500 between the real numbers and the fantastic numbers that have entered the popular imagination. Easy. Deviancy has again been redefined up so that a vast array of behavior previously thought to be benign or at least morally ambiguous is now defined as criminal. How? Take perhaps the most famous and widely reported study of the rape epidemic, the one done by Mary Koss for Ms. Magazine. She studied 6,159 college students and she found that 15% had been raped and another 11% subject to attempted rape. She also reported that in a single year, 3,187 college women reported 862 cases of rape or attempted rape. That is more than one incident for every four women per year. If you do the math, you see that at that rate, about three out of every four undergraduate women would be the victim of rape or attempted rape by graduation day. Again, the real world turns out to be rather different. Reports from 2,400 campuses mandated by the Student Right to Know and Campus Security Act of 1990 showed that fewer than 1,000 rapes had occurred in that year. That is about half a rape per campus per year. Barnard College, for example, a hotbed of anti-rape and take back the night activity, released statistics in 1991 showing no reports of rape, date or otherwise, among its uh, 2,000 students. In 1992, there were two reports yielding one confirmed case. The Columbia University, with 19,000 students, reported two rapes in that period, neither of which was substantiated. The discrepancy is easily explained. Date rape has been expanded by Koss and other r r researchers to include the behavior that you and I would not recognize as rape. And not just you and I, the, the supposed victims themselves do not recognize it as rape. In the Koss study, three quarters of the women whom she labeled as rape victims did not consider themselves to have been raped. Fully 42% had to further sexual relations with the so-called rapist. Now, women who have been raped are not generally known for going back for more sex with their assailant. Something is wrong here. What is wrong is the extraordinarily loose definition of what constitutes rape. Among the 10 questions that Cost asked her subjects are these. Have you had sexual in intercourse when you didn't want to because you were overwhelmed by a man's continual arguments and pressure? Or because a man gave you alcohol or drugs? I'm only guessing now, but I would say that, that using these uh, criteria, the number of sexual deviants in this room is somewhere between a quorum and an absolute majority. The Stanford study, the one that turns up one out of every three women students as, as victims of date rape, asked its subjects if they had ever had, quote, full sexual activity when they did not want to. In other words, sex plus regret equals rape, which fits well Catherine McKinnon's definition of rape. Quote, politically, I call it rape whenever a woman has sex and feels violated. The cornerstone of this new and breathtakingly loose definition is the idea of verbal coercion. I quote from Acquaintance Rape, The Hidden Epidemic, edited by Andrea Parrott of Cornell. 
chapter entitled Nonviolent Sexual Coercion. Quote, we define verbal sexual coercion as a woman's consented to unwanted sexual activity because of a man's ver verbal arguments, not including verbal threats of physical force. Not including th verbal threats of physical force. With rape so radically redefined up to include offering a drink or being insistent, it is no surprise that the result is an epidemic of sexual deviancy. Of course, behind these numbers is an underlying ideology about the inherent aberrancy of all heterosexual relations. As Andrea Dworkin once said, romance is rape embellished by meaningful looks. The, the date rape epidemic is just empirical dressing for a larger theory which holds that because relations between men and women are inherently unequal, sex can never be truly consensual. It is always coercive. Quote, the similarity between the patterns, rhythms, roles, and emotions not to mention acts which make up rape on the one hand and intercourse on the other, writes Catherine McKinnon, makes it difficult to sustain the customary d d distinctions between, between pathology and normalcy, between sex and violence. And she continues, compare the victim's reports of rape with women's reports of sex. They look a lot alike. In this light, the major distinction between intercourse normal and rape abnormal is that the normal happens so often that one cannot get anyone to see anything wrong with it. Or, as Susan Estridge once put it, many feminists would argue that so long as women are powerless relative to men, viewing yes as a sign of true consent is misguided. Forgive me, but if yes is not a sign of true consent, then what is? A notarized contract? If there is no such thing as real consent, then the radical feminist ideal is realized. All intercourse is rape. Who needs the studies? The incidence of rape becomes not 25% or 33 or 50. It's 100%. And Naomi Wolf can then write in the beauty myth that we have today, quote, a situation among the young in which boys rape and girls get raped as a normal course of events. Date rape is only the most extreme example of deviancy to find high enough to catch a huge chunk of normal everyday behavior in its net. It is the most extreme example because it is criminal. But then there are the lesser offenses, a bewildering array of transgressions that come under the rubric of sexual harassment, whose, uh, def whose definition can be equally loose and floating, but always raised high enough to turn innocent behavior into deviancy. As Alan Bloom once wrote, what used to be understood as modes of courtship are now seen as modes of male intimidation. So much for the family and for heterosexual relations. On now to the third great area of the new deviancy, thought crimes. Last month, I was visited by an FBI agent doing a routine background check on a former employee of mine who was now being considered for a high administration post. The agent went through the usual checklist of questions that I had heard many times before. Questions about financial difficulties, drug abuse, alcoholism. But then he popped a new one. Did this person ever show any prejudice to a group based on race, ethnicity, gender, national origin, etc.? He was not interested in whether the person had ever been involved in a racial incident, the FBI would already have known about that. What he wanted to know was different. He wanted to know my friend's deeper thoughts, 
feelings that he might only have betrayed to someone with whom he had worked intimately for two years. This was the point in the questioning at which I was supposed to testify whether I had heard m my friend ever tell any Polish jokes or the political equivalent. Happily, I had not. But that is when it occurred to me that incorrect racial thinking and insensitive racial speech has now achieved official status as thought crime. Now, again, we start with real deviance, racial violence of the kind once carried out by the Klan and now by such freelancers as the, the two men in Tampa who were convicted of setting fire to a black tourist. These are outlawed and punished. So are the more d benign but still contemptible acts of non-violent racial discrimination, as in housing, for example. But now that overt racial actions have been criminalized and are regularly p punished, the threshold for deviancy has been ratcheted up. The project now is to, f is to find prejudiced thinking, instincts, anecdotes, attitudes. The great arena for this project is the American Academy. The proliferation of speech codes on campus, restrained only by their obvious unconstitutionality, was an attempt by the university to curtail public, even private speech, that may cause offense to groups designated for special protection. A religious student at the University of, M of Michigan, for example, offers the opinion in public that homosexuality is immoral and find himself, and he finds himself forced to recant and sentenced to sensitivity training for the purpose of re-education. The irony here is quite complete. It used to be that homosexuality was considered deviant, but now that that, that has been declared a simple lifestyle choice under the rules of defining deviancy down, those who are not current with the new definitions and have the misfortune to say so in public now find themselves defined as deviant, thought deviant, under the rules of defining deviancy up. There is, of course, the now famous case of the University of Pennsylvania student who called a group of rowdy black sorority sisters who were making noise outside his dorm in the middle of the night, Bahamas. He was charged with racial harassment. A host of learned scholars were assigned the absurd task of locating the racial antecedents of the term Bahama. They could find none. They should have asked me, actually. I could have saved them a lot of trouble. My father called me Bahama so many times it almost became a term of endearment. <laughs> and I don't think he was racially motivated. Nonetheless, the university, convinced that there was some racial animus behind this exotic word, and determined not to let it go unpunished, tried to pressure the student into admitting his guilt. The university offered him a plea bargain. Proceedings would be stopped if he confessed, and allowed himself to be re-educated through a, quote, program for living in a diverse community environment. Consider, the psychotic raving in the middle of the street is free to rave. No one will force him into treatment. But a student who hurls the word behema at a bunch of sorority sisters is threatened with the ultimate sanction at the disposal of the university, expulsion, unless he submits to treatment to correct his deviant thinking. This may seem ironic, but it's easily explained. Under the new dispensation, it's not insanity, but insensitivity that is the true sign of deviancy, requiring thought control and re-education. One kind of deviancy we are quite prepared to live with, the other not. Indeed, one kind, psychosis, we are hardly prepared to call deviancy at all. We call it homelessness. And as Moynihan points out, we accept it as part of the landscape. Family life, heterosexual relations, and now deviant thinking. The picture is complete. 
in a very complex, two-sided process of cultural redefinition. Real deviancy is defined down and normalized, and the normal is defined up as deviant. That, of course, makes us all so much more morally equal. The mentally ill are not really ill. They just lack housing. It's the rest of us who are, gu are guilty of deviant thinking for harboring beneath the bland and niceties of middle-class life, racist, misogynist, homophobic, and other corrupt and corrupting insensitivities. Ordinary criminality we're learning to live with. What we are learning that we cannot live with is the heretofore unrecognized the violence against women that lurks beneath the facade of ordinarily, seemingly uh, benign heterosexual relations. The single the parent and the broken home is no longer considered deviant. It is the Ozzie and Harriet family, rife with abuse and molestation, that is the seedbed of deviance. The rationalization of deviancy reaches its logical conclusion. The deviant is declared normal, and the normal is unmasked as deviant. The project is complete. What real difference is there between us? And that, of course, is the point, is it not? Defining deviancy up like defining deviancy down is an adventure in moral equivalence. As such, it is the son of an old project which met its unfortunate demise with the end of the Soviet Empire. There once was the idea of the moral equivalence between East and West, even though the Soviets appeared to be imperialist, and brutal, and corrupt and rapacious, we were really as bad as they were. We could match them crime for crime, throughout the world. Well, this species of moral equivalence is now dead. The liberation of the communist empire, the opening of the archives, the testimony of the, the former inmates, all of these have made a, a mockery of this version of moral equivalence. But ideology abhors a vacuum. So we have a new moral equivalence. The moral equivalence within Western society of the normal and the deviant. It is a bold new way to strip the life of the bourgeois West of its moral sheen. Because once it becomes, to use Catherine McKinnon's words, difficult to sustain the customary distinctions be distinction between pathology and normalcy, the moral superiority to which normal middle-class life pretends disappears. And the perfect vehicle for exposing the rottenness, the abnormality of the of bourgeois life is defining deviancy up. After all, the middle classes, the law-abiding, define their own virtue in contrast to the deviant, a contrast publicly dramatized by segregation, opprobrium, ostracism, and punishment. And now it turns out that this great contrast between normalcy and deviance is a farce. The real deviants, mirabile dictu, are those who carry the mask of sanity. The middle cl classes living on their cozy suburban streets, abusing their children, violating their women, and harboring deep inside them the most unholy of thoughts. Defining deviancy up is a new way of satisfying an old ideological agenda. But it also fills a psychological need. The need was identified by Moynihan, how to cope with the explosion of real deviancy. One way is denial. Defining deviancy down creates the pretense that deviance has disappeared because it has been now declared to be normal. But another strategy is distraction. Defining deviancy up creates brand new deviancies that we can now go off and fight that distracts us from the old deviancy and gives us the feeling that despite the murder and the mayhem and the madness all around us, we are really preserving and policing our norms. So helpless in the face of the explosion of real criminality, for example, we satisfy our crime-fighting needs with the crusade against date rape. Like looking for your lost wallet under the street lamp, even though you lost it somewhere else, the job is easier, if not terribly relevant to the problem at hand. 
Defining deviancy up creates a whole new universe of behavior to police and, by the way, a higher class of offender, more malleable too. The guilt-ridden bourgeois, the vulnerable college student, is a far easier object of social control than the hardened criminal and the raving lunatic. These new crusades do nothing, of course, about real criminality and lunacy, but they make us feel that we are making inroads on deviancy nonetheless. It feels good. A society must feel that it is policing its norms by attacking deviancy. Having given up fighting the real thing, we can't give up the fight. So we, so we fight the new deviancy with satisfying vigor and energy. That it is largely a phantom and a phony seems not to matter at all. Thank you for listening to today's Bradley Lecture. I'm Wilson, and I surely hope you enjoyed it. Tune in to the AI Podcast channel for more, and be sure to review us and subscribe on your podcast player of choice. Until next time, we'll see you then. Thank you.